everyone. Um, I want to say a few things before we start. One is that it's kind of similarly to last week. If you're coming here today expecting to know by the end what you're supposed to do, um, this will not help. <laughs> um, two is that I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to like what medieval texts are like. Some of this will be familiar, and just very briefly. Um, the two, there's kind of three main genres of, of Jewish medieval texts that, that bear on halakha. So one of those is commentary, one of those is codification, and one of those is uh, responsa. So we're going to have, actually we are going to have all three of those in here, and they're very different in important ways. So when you have a commentary, you have to know what the commentary is commentating about. Um, and so all the, thing, all the commentaries we're going to look at are commentating about sources we looked at last week, uh, many of which I brought today. Uh, did you grab a source sheet from the middle? Uh, many of which I, I brought again on this source sheet today, which is part of what, what accounts for why it's incredibly long. Um, so, so that's commentary. So a commentary is going to look at a text and say, what does this text mean? And it might add on, so it'll come to it with like an interpretive lens. Um, and and in, in halakha, that interpretive lens might like tilt towards the, the normative of like, well, this text is binding. I'm interpreting this text authoritatively, and that will affect how you should live. Um, so that's like commentary as halakha. Um, and most of what, and like the, one of the biggest projects of the Middle Ages was like, what does the Talmud mean? Um, and, and all of our favorite Talmud commentators, all of the most you know, classic and original Talmud commentators are medieval thinkers who we're going to be looking at. So that's commentary. Then there's codification. A classic codifier would be Maimonides. He's not the first, but he's arguably the greatest. Um, Rabbi Wachenfeld just taught a whole series on codification. Codification is a slightly different thing in that it's not saying I'm going to go in order of the Talmud, I'm going to number my pages in accordance with the Talmud's pages, I'm going to start out every paragraph that I write is going to have a quote from the Talmud in it. Codification is about you're a Jew, you want to know how to live your life, and here I prepared the Mishnah Torah and you can read it and you'll know how to live your life. Um, the Mishnah Torah is, however, also an interpretive tool. Uh, often when you have a question about what does the go if you're learning Talmud and you're like, what does this line mean? Um, there's a little guy in Mishpat in the, the top, um, and he'll tell you where to find this section, where this section of the Talmud corresponds to in the Rambam, and then you can open up the Maimonides, Mishnah Torah, and see what he says the law is, and then read that back into the text and see how he got there. We're going to do that today when we read Maimonides. We're going to say, okay, what he's writing is code, he's writing law, this is not a commentary, but he got that from somewhere. It's based on a read of the Talmud, and it's an interesting exercise and an important exercise to say, how did Maimonides read the Talmud such that he got to this code, okay? So that's code as slightly different from commentary, but still a little bit the same. Um, and the last one is responsa. We're only going to look at a tiny little bit of responsa literature today. Um, the next two weeks are going to be much more heavily responsa with a little bit of code. Um, responsa literature is someone had a question in their community and sent a letter to a great rabbi, sometimes in their own community and sometimes in some other community. Or it could be a great rabbi who says, these sometimes we know that this happened and sometimes we don't know that this happened and there's some books of responsa where this is entirely the case. A great rabbi was like, I think everyone should know the answer to this question, so let me write a question and then I will write an answer. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but responsa is like an art form that is still very alive today. If you ever come here for Shacharit on a weekday morning, you will hear some very modern day responsa literature. Uh, you know, we discussed Fitbits a few weeks ago, things like that, like really live things. People are still sending now emails more <laughs> to rabbis and asking for, for questions, for guidance in modern day lives, but, the, but the, the, what's going to guide the answer is then this whole interpretive model of, well, what does the verse say, and then what does the Talmud say, and then how has the Talmud been interpreted, and how have Jews lived, and now how do we behave in this area? And that gets particularly exciting when you're talking about something like a Fitbit, which like, lo hai avlo right? Can I wear my Fitbit on Shabbat? Well, like, what do you look to as evidence for that? Like, that's very interesting. Um, but in our case, um, we'll be looking at much more kind of mundane, like boring kinds of things. Um, oh, welcome. Uh, just grab a source sheet from the middle if you've come in since I last said that. 
Um, okay, so that's responsa. That'll be mostly for next time. But anyway, so just three genres, and, and we're going to be looking like cross genre -ly, but we're but mostly we're looking at commentators, so that's why I organized it um, according to the two main sources we looked at last time, which was the Gemara and Brachot about Erva. I'm trying to start a hashtag Herva, um, <laughs> so you can hop on that if you want to tweet about this year. Um, anyways, um, uh, so the brachot, which is about Erva nakedness, and then um, and then we'll look at so that's page one, and then we'll get to um, and then on page at the bottom of page two, we'll, we'll start looking at sources about ketuvot. That'll take us a long time. Uh, but we get to men very briefly on page 8, and then we have some pictures on page 9. I want to turn your attention to page 10. Um, page 10 is a timeline. So if you, we're going to be looking at a lot of different people who lived in all sorts of different geographies and all sorts of different times. Um, Jews in the medieval world like lived all over the place, um, and they weren't always talking to each other. Uh, fun fact, the Rambam didn't know that Tosfot existed. He thought he was like the last great scholar on earth. So when we opened like, oh, the Rambam has a disagreement with Tosfo, like he didn't know they were there. Um, and that's part, that urgency is a lot of what prompted the Rambam to like be the Rambam, which is amazing. But anyways, so that's like a whole thing to consider is like who's reading who's, who is where, who's a student of whom, um, and who's in like what kind of uh, situation. So for example, if you look at the Rosh, like the, uh, I don't know, he's around here, 1258. Um, so Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, who we'll look at today, he was born and educated in Germany, but he actually, he fled the Rindfleisch massacres all the way to Spain and then was influenced from both. And that gave him a lot of power because he was the inheritor of this Ashkenazi tradition, but at the same time he like brought it together with the Sephardic tradition and that meant that he reached in both directions. And today that reach of the Rosh continues. Um, okay, so that's kind of an introduction to like the Jewish Middle Ages. Um, Ashkenaz was not very weak, uh, was, was rather weak. We have some Ashkenazim, the Ravya is Ashkenazi. Um, he's pretty early on here, he's 1140. We have some people in France, so we have, you know, the Rashi and Tosfot are obviously in France. Uh, the Ravad is in France. Some people in Germany. Um, we have some people in Italy. Italy is like its own kind of thing, it's not really Ashkenaz. The Rid, Tosfot Rid we'll look at from Venice. Um, but eventually, uh, eventually, you know, they, people get expelled, from, everyone who's in Spain gets expelled from Spain, and everyone who's in Ashkenaz dies of the Black Plague, um, and, and so that, that all makes the Middle Ages really fun. Um, okay, so with that introduction, we're going to dive right in. Um, so we'll start with just a review of the Gemara and Brachot, which hopefully people remember from last time. You have like a pared down edition of it here. Um, so Rabbi Yitzchak says, Tafach v'isha erva, an exposed handbreadth in a woman constitutes nakedness. Lamai the Gemara asks, regarding what, what are we talking about? The answer is, Ela b'ishto Oh, we're only talking about this very narrow thing. Um, you, even on your wife, you need to be concerned about a hand's breadth of skin um, when you're saying Kriyat Shema. Um, and we'll get it, it, okay, and then, so then the Gemara continues, Amar of Shishit, Sa'ar b'isha erva, hair on a woman constitutes nakedness, Shayamar sarich ha'izim. ha'izim. It says, your hair is like a flock of goats trailing down from Mount Kilad. Um, so the, the two main questions I want to look at on this Gemara are, when is hair erva? So, right, we know tefach b'isha erva is v'ishto v'kriyat So a hand breath on a woman is nakedness. Oh, the Gemara says that's talking about your wife and for kriyat shema. But what about hair, right? The Gemara continues past there. It doesn't go back and say, and say what about all, like, limai, hair, and voice, and all this stuff we've talked, and, and calf, all this stuff we've talked about since. Oh, b'ishto v'kriyat shema? It doesn't go back and say that. So can we assume that we're just talking about b'ishto v'kriyat shema? Or do we have to say, no, actually, this means all the time. And, um, and for which women are we even talking about? Is all hair for all women um, erva? Or is it just once you're married? That's kind of our normal practice, but reading this text, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that. Uh, you would just say, all hair on all women is nakedness. Um, and then the next, the other question is, how much hair is erva? So is it that tefach b'isha erva applied, that the hand's breath on a woman is nakedness applies also to her hair? So I could be like, okay, tefach, like I'm measuring everywhere. Or is it actually that only applies to maybe your skin, or maybe that's the part that applies just to your wife and for kriyachma, but the rest of the time, all hair maybe constitutes erva. Um, so, so there's a lot of questions that are raised by this text, and those are the questions, that, those are the interpretive questions that 
um, our friends here are going to be looking at. So we're going to dive right in. So we're in 1A, the Rambam here. And if you, again, if you're wondering, oh, when did the Rambam live? Refer to the back. Um, okay. So Rambam Mishnah Torah says, Kashim Shasurli Kruot Keneged So Amimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimim
I think he would say it, it would help. Yeah, you should turn around. Okay, so jumping over now to Italy, to the Piscay Rid. Um, okay, so El Ishto Bekriachma, Amar Roshisha, Sayar, so he's just he's quoting the Gemara, Amar Roshisha, Sayar Bisha Ervash, and Amar Sarich Kader Haizim, fine, quotes the Gemara, Pirush, Shaluis the Kalbe Sayar Nashim. He says, Don't look at the hair of women. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Shok Bisha Erva, Shene Amar Gali Shok Avri Narut. The Ketiv Tagel Ervat Cha. So he's, and then, and then he continues quoting Gemara. He says, Rabbi Yitzchak says, the calf of a woman is nakedness, as it says, um, uncover the leg and pass through rivers. Vekatu uh, Tagel Ervat Cha. And in the following verse says, your nakedness shall be revealed. Pirush Shalui Kra Adam Keneged Shok So what that means is, you shouldn't read Kriyachma near the um, near the calf of your of your wife. Amar Shmuel, Kobi Sheher Ba Shmuel says, the voice of a woman is nakedness, Shnamar ki kuli chari vor ech naveh, sweet is your voice and your countenance is alluring, pirush shalu yazin lakol hanashim, which means don't listen to the voice of women. What do you notice about the difference between hair and voice versus the a woman's calf, in terms of how he is explaining the Talmud, when he has these little pirush this? Hair and voice are always. Yeah, hair and voice are always, and calf is your wife and for Kriyachma. Now, it's very difficult to understand how the read, how the read um, reads the Talmud to say that, because we have Tefach Bisha Erva Lamai Bishova Kriyachma, and then we have this whole long list that the Talmud seems to treat all the same way. And, but he's treating them differently. He's saying calf is different from, from voice or hair, which are always. And does he make a difference between uh, married women and not married women? No, right? So, so far we have the Ra'avya who makes a, a distinction between married women and not married women versus the Rid and the Rambam who are saying uh, no distinction as far as we can tell and as far as we can tell kind of... Oh, sorry, the Rambam here is just talking about Kriyatma. We haven't seen the more broadly for the Rambam. But the Rid is really saying all the time, like never look at a woman's hair. and. That woman is defined by all women, as far as we can tell, and he's also saying, and, and never listen to a woman's um, voice. But it's sort of interesting that he's complimenting the voice, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, so it's a, a, a kind of um, it also resonates to me as being um, men don't have control, you know, or, or you know, as nice as your voice is, as sweet as is alluring. Interesting, that it's not just don't. You know, don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. But it doesn't leave it open to men like, oh, she has a bad voice, you can listen. No, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, but well, that's a good point. Uh, okay, so just th this Rashba is very important. Um, we'll, we'll like mark it for this week, but then in the future, that like a lot is going to turn on this Rashba in the next two weeks. Um, okay, so the Rashba again quotes the quotes the Talmud. These are all commentators. The Amar Rabbi Yitzchak Tefach Bisha Erva. So Rabbi Yitzchak says a hand's breadth in a woman is nakedness. Who kuna visho v'kriyachma? And we say, oh, it's talking about um, your wife and when you're reading Shema. And uh, and, he, and then he brings down the Ravid who says the Eshar Dafka Bimakum Tanu Ashaba. Uh, and this, the tafach that is prohibited to see in a woman, that is in a, a place of hers that's normally covered, aval, paneha, yadeha, veragleha, vekol dibura, but her face, her hands, her feet, or her legs maybe, it depends, like, yad, in Hebrew, right, there's like, yadeha could mean her arm and it could mean her hand, and ragleha could mean her legs and could mean her feet, um, vekol dibura, and her speaking voice, she'eno zamer, which is not her singing voice, and her hair that has come down from her braid or bun, tzama can mean a few different things, it's not clear what that means, which isn't covered, we're, we're not concerned about that because he's used to it and, and it's not going to distract him. Um, okay, so this business about some hair that's coming out from under its covering, that's going to become very important for all of the people who are then going to, in the future, say women can show some amount of hair. Like, all, all the modern day folks who are going to say 
yes, hair covering is a requirement, but some amount of hair is permitted, it's going to turn on, the, on this Rashba who says, yes, like some hair comes out of her tzama, what is her tzama? Question mark. Um, and, um, and that is a permitted amount, of, and that is hair that is not covered, and that is okay. That is not even subject to the, that's not even subject to the statement of, um, of Rav Shishet, of Sarvi Sheherba, according to the Rashba. Does everyone understand the read, right? He's a commentator on, on um, tefach b'isha erva, and then he says tefach b'isha erva um, is only applying to, the like, hands breadth of a woman is nakedness, that only applies to parts of women which are not normally covered. Here's my definitive list of parts of women which are not normally covered, and some amount of hair is included in that list, which is very interesting. Um, okay. Um, uh, we'll just wrap up this um, section with the Shulchan Aruch. So the Shulchan Aruch here says, Sar shal isha shedar kalich sota shuli kro konegdo. Hair woman, which is normally um, covered, is prohibited to read Shema near it. Uh, and then the Ramah chimes in here and says, A few ishto, uh, even your wife, aval betulot shedar kali lech pro rosh mutar. But um, unmarried women who normally go without head covering, that's permissible. Um, and then the and, and the Rama continues. So he's he's quoting the Rashba, right? That's very important that the, that the Rashba gets brought in by the Rama. Hair of women which normally come out from their braid slash bun, again, uh, no and and how much more so hair of non-Jewish women a few dark halach. So even even if it's um, even if the non-Jewish woman's way is normally to cover, it doesn't matter. Like that's not going to be a distraction for you non-Jewish women can be near you and uh, with their hair uncovered. Um, one important note is that it's not, it's the Roma and not the Shulchan Aruch who says um, that, that unmarried women usually go out without their hair covered. And if you turn, we'll get to this more uh, at the end, but if you turn to page eight, this is Shulchan Aruch in um, Ebenezer 21, and right now we're in Shulchan Aruch in Orachayim 75, so like we're in totally different areas of Shulchan Aruch. But if you look at number two here, um, on source eight, it's like mar- labeled number two in English, and Seif Bet in the Hebrew. Lo t'ilachna b'no Yisrael p'rot rosh b'shuk. Echad p'nuya v'echad eshet ish. He's not ambiguous. Jewish women should not go with an uncovered head in the marketplace, whether they're married or not. Right? Shulchan Aruch thinks every Jewish woman needs to cover her hair. So when you have the Ramah over here saying, oh, non-married women don't cover their hair and you can read Shema in an environment where those women are around, that's a huge break from the Shulchan Aruch. And, it's, and it's, it's interesting that it's like hidden over here and actually doesn't come in over there. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's, so that's that. And, I, and I, we haven't resolved the complexities of the Gemara and Brachot. And, and we're not, one second, and we're not going to, right? So like you could say, Leo, we're only talking about Kriya Shema. Like, that's a very, you know, okay, it's two very important moments of your day, but like, how's, that's not going to determine what I wear to work. And the answer is like, yes, unless you think that actually it's not talking about Kriya Shema, right? Unless you, unless you read it like the Rid. Um, and, and by the way, like the Rambam and the Rif don't even, like, they're not even talking here because like, they're much more strict and they don't think like, they think that like, the Gemara in Ketubo is going to tell you what to do all the time. So you don't need this to tell you what to do all the time. Um, and this is more about what men should be looking at while they're, reading, while they're reading Shema, because this isn't a source about everyday hair covering. We have other sources for that. So, right, you can, you can, so even if you're going to have a very strict approach, you can still read this narrowly, so long as you read the other Gemara in Ketubo, which we're about to look at, very expansively. So, so a, a narrow reading of this doesn't give you a, a ha, doesn't give you permission to not cover your, doesn't necessarily give you permission to not cover your hair. I think I'm like speaking in code. Are people following <laughs> what I'm saying a little bit? Right. So there's there's a lot of different reads of this Gemara and Brachot. There's a very narrow read of this is just talking about this very limited two you know two maybe if you're from five minutes a day um, and uh, and um, that so that okay so it's two minutes a day so put your talus over your head and don't look at anything and you'll be great and women can go about their merry way right or you can say well I reject that that narrow read of this Gemara and I'm going to say that when it says Sarbi Sha'erva, that's talking about all the time and then you have a very strict read but you can land in that same strict halachic place even with a, choosing the narrow read of this Gemara and Brachot Okay, I think I said it right this time. Um, cool, John, you had a question. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so,
Yeah, um, maybe you're hinting at this, and that's where we're going. When it's like we keep saying, like Shadarka Luxoto normally covers or what falls out of her bun, or like how do we? Who gets to determine what normal is? Right. Yeah, we're not gonna get to that today. Uh, come back next week. Um, but that's like in our day and age, that's a huge question. And ultimately, like every woman choosing, making choices about her hair covering is gonna, in some ways, like you're a little bit on your own on that. Um, because what we'll see, just to like tip what's gonna happen, is that there are people who say like, um, well, okay. I'm actually not gonna go there, but whatever. You'll you'll see that there's a lot of options, and many of those options um, are sensitive to this like cultural contextualness that Shadarka Lachso of the like she normally covers um, opens up, and and it gets opened up even further the minute we start talking about Dayuhudi, which we haven't even gotten to yet today. We saw that last week, and we'll see it in a minute right now, um, which is this like culturally or potentially depending on how you read it, it's a culturally contextual um, like halachic category, which is really interesting. Um, so, 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 so yes, and then the question is, who is your culture? Um, and, 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 um, and that's a very challenging question for a lot of people. But I would say, like, for my grandmother who didn't cover her hair, but was, you know, from in her family since Moshe Rabinu, like, that was not a complicated question, right? She was like, no women I know cover their hair. I, don't, I cover my hair in shawl. That's what we do. This is what we do, right? And, 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 um, and that, you know, and, and it's, like with that in mind, like there are, you know, it's not just like, oh, like I don't care about halacha, I don't cover my hair. No, like people make halachic decisions that like also involve not covering their hair. Um, whether or not like that, you know what my choice is, I'm wearing it on my head. Um, but, um, but yeah, I guess like, right, uh, well, okay. I was gonna maybe say this at the beginning or the end, but I guess since we're talking about it, I'll just say it now, which is like, I think my goal in teaching this is that anyone who makes a decision doesn't say, well, halakha is over there and I'm over here. Like, I, I would prefer for everyone to say, like, there's a spectrum of halakha and I'm engaging with it as I make this choice, whatever that choice ends up being. That's, I think, my goal in, uh, in, in the way I've been laying out these sources and the way I will continue to in the upcoming weeks. That like, halakha should have a say and you should see yourself as an actor in a halakhic system whenever you um, behave in, uh, in the world all the time. And uh, you matter, yes. I, I think that this question will be overruled or whatever by my later sources. But based on the sources that we've seen just now, it's like, this is men's problem. Like, you, as a man, you should not be looking whatever. But from these sources, is it actually anything incumbent on women to cover their hair or for men to avoid looking at women's hair? So that's actually a great question in these sources. Meaning once we get to Ketubot, I think that question goes away because the whole concept of Dai Hudid is like, what are your friends doing? Um, or, or at least could be interpreted as what are your friends doing? But, the, but in Gemara and Brachot, that's an interesting question because that's a question about nakedness in general, right? Like, like secular version of nakedness, right? Like, I can be in the shower naked and that's totally fine, but I can't walk out to the street naked or else I'll get arrested. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like, that's kind of like a strange thing, right? And so it's like, is, is nakedness about me or is nakedness about other people? Well, or is nakedness not about either of those and it's just 100% contextual? Like, if I'm in a nudist, or if I'm on a naked beach or, like, in a nudist colony, then nakedness, like, means something totally different than me walking in somewhere where everyone else is wearing clothes that I'm naked. So I, I don't have any, like, necessarily any answers or, like, grand theories on that, but, like, your question is, yes, a question in, in the Gemara and Brachot, but I would say that the tensions there reflect, like, tensions that are still very alive in, in our world about nakedness altogether. Um, I want to persevere because we have so much left to get through. Um, okay. Uh, so just a quick recap. The next like two pages are this whole Gemara and Ketubot. Um, I'm vaguely tempted to go through it all again quickly. Yeah, unless people are like super holding. No, you're not. Okay, let's go. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so the, the Mishnah says, so, so what's at stake here? What's at stake here is um, your ketubah. You could forfeit your ketubah if you do the following things. If you, if you violate dat Moshe or you violate dat Yehudit. So we have these two categories. And part of the big interpretive question is, 
what are these categories? And we, we spent some time kind of parsing that last week. So, and the Mishnah is going to give us examples. So, what is that Moshe? You feed him food that, that hasn't been tithed. You have sex with him when you are Niza. You don't take challah of bread that you're making for the home and you make a nether, you make a vow, and you don't keep it. What is that? What, what would it mean to violate that Yehudi? You go out with your head unbound or unbraided or something like that. We um, discussed that also last week, what parua might mean. You, you spin fiber in the shuk. You speak to all kinds of people. Abba Shul Adin. Maybe you curse your in laws in front of him. I mean, Tarfon says, even someone who's really loud, what does really loud mean? Oh, when she speaks inside her house, her neighbors hear her talking. Um, the, the Gemara keeps going. The Gemara will eventually limit that, by the way, to. Um, to uh, and Alana, who's not here right now, but Alana brought this up last week. The Gemara eventually limits that to um, who's like very loud during sex. That's that's kind of how we end up interpreting the Kolanit. Um, okay, so the Gemara goes on here. The, the Gemara quotes Ezo Hida Yehudi Yitzav Rosha Parua. What is the, the Gemara quotes the Mishnah? What is that Yehudi? Oh, it's someone who goes out with her hair um, unbound or uncovered. Um, and then, but the Gemara raises the challenge, Rosha Parua del Reitayi, what do you mean that's da Yehudi? That is a mitzvah in the Torah. And then we learn that out from the Sota, Upara at Rosha Isha. And then we bring in the Sifrei, Tana Debe, the, the Gemara brings in the Sifrei, Tana Debe Rabbi Ishmael, as Haral, you know Israel, Shalu Yatsu Bifra, Shalu Yatsu Bifra Rosh. Um, so we learn from we learn from the Sif the Sifre reads that pasuk to teach us that Jewish women should not go out with their hair uncovered, um, and that means that it is a deoraita to have your hair covered. Oh, but then we say deoraita kalta shabir dami da yehudi da fiu kalta nami aser. We say, oh, it's different levels of things. At a deoraita level, a kalta would be sufficient. But for and and we're going to look at Rashi in a second. He's a medieval commentator, after all, who's going to tell us what a kalta is. Da yehudi a few kalta nami aser. But for the for the for the level of da yehudi, even a kalta would not be sufficient. And then we say, wait, but Rabbi Yochanan says that a kalta is sometimes yes sufficient. What's Rabbi Yochanan talking about, asks Rabbi Zera. Well, if you'll say it's when she's in the shuk, that's a violation of Dat Yehudi. So it must be when she's in the chatzer. It must be when she's in her courtyard. Uh, wait, but if she needs to be wearing a kalta in her courtyard, lo avram No one's going to be married if you say everyone can divorce their wives without paying their ketubah just for sitting in their courtyards with, um, with their heads totally uncovered. Amar um, Abai Vitema Rav Kahana. Abai says, and perhaps also Rav Kahana says, well, what is Rabbi Yochanan talking about where a kalta is sufficient on every level? Going from one alley, uh, one courtyard to another, or if you're going in, a, in an alley. Okay, that was the quick version. Um, Fine. Um, so a bunch of questions. So one question would be, what is a kalta? Kalta seems to be the oraita minimum. So even if you're going to completely write off the Gemara and Brachot, the Gemara and Brachot applies to men for five minutes a day, put your talents over your head, check chak, you're done, has no implications for what women need to do, you're still going to be stuck with this, which says that wearing a kalta is a mitzvah, do, is a, is a, is a, is a oraita obligation. Okay, so then what is a kalta? Um, what is, so we have these different, Gradations of places, right? We have our chater. We have in between two chater from one yard to the next. What is that? Um, and and uh, in an alley, and then we have the shuk. So what is the status? Let's say I'm having um, the great Anshe Shalom Bake Off in my chater. Um, so how much of my hair do I need to cover for that if like, I'm opening my home up to the entire shawl? Um, so what's the status of a yard if there's lots of men around? That's going to be an interpretive question we'll look at. Um, what is Da Yehudi? Right? The Mishnah asks, what is Da Yehudi? Gives us a bunch of examples, but like, what is that? What are we, what, what is this category? A bunch of examples, that's a, a, a classic Mishnah and Gemara way to help me like poke at what the category is, but like, let's try and, and stroke towards some definitions. Um, and what level of prohibition is bareheadedness? If I were to walk out like without anything on my head, like, what actually am I violating? What have I, what have I actually done wrong? Uh, so those are all of our questions. Okay, moving on. Page four. 
Um, okay, so we're gonna look at Rashi here. Rashi is uh, like probably uh, the most famous uh, interpreter of the Talmud. He gets to be on the inside column so that if something starts eating the outsides of your Talmud, Rashi will still be there. Um, and um, okay, so Rashi, so uh, he, so his question first of all is, what does that Yehudi mean? So he says, Shenalgu b'no Israel, ba'afalgav d'lokatiba. It's the practices of Jewish women, even though they're not written in the Torah. Those practices with Within this idea of Dayu Hudi, carry this like this like really important nature, such that your husband could divorce you without giving you your ketubah if you violate them. Okay, so right practices of Jewish women that are not written in the Torah. That's Rashi's working definition of Dayu Hudi. Um, and the question is like, what what is that? Oh, it's the practice of Jewish women not to to, to do their dishes by hand. Okay, now a dishwasher is invented. Is it that Yehudi not to use my dishwasher? Because it's the practice of Jewish women to do their dishes by mm-hmm. hand. Uh, right, so that's the question of like, what, what do we mean by that Yehudi? Yeah, sure. Um, is it clear that that Yehudi is not Sarabana? No, that's not clear at all. Yeah, good question. But like the cool thing is, like by Rashi's read, if that Yehudi is Sarabana, then who gets to make that Sarabana? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Right, okay, so fine, so maybe their practice is heavily influenced by their husbands, but if all women see Jakku and didn't do it, whatever, right, it's still the, theoretically at least dependent on their practice. You don't have to like it, yeah, ew. <laughs> Oh, but that's everywhere, meaning, right, like, oh, it's our minhag, why is it our minhag? Because it's our minhag, well, can we change our minhag? No, because it's our minhag, right, like, that happens, right? Oh, why do we have a mechitza that looks like this? I don't know, but it's our mechitza and it looks like this, right? Uh, <laughs> um, right, that's, like, all, all over, that's a question on Judaism, but, it, it, yes. Um, and it, 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 what, what's good about it, in my opinion, is that it leads to um, slow and thoughtful change and continuity. Um, yeah, or not a Jewish question, or Anyone else? Okay. Um, okay, so that's that Yehudi. Rashi gives us this like working definition. He's not the only definition that we will see of that Yehudi. Uh, here's where I pull out my notes. Just to make sure I don't miss anyone on that. Uh, okay, and that will just keep going in order. So Rashi is then also going to say, what is a kalta? A kalta is sal shegesho milamata bi kibul. Uh, so it's a basket that has it has a beat kibul. It has a like like a bowl kind of thing facing downwards so that it stays on your head, and then it has another bowl facing upwards so that you can hold stuff in it like your spindle and your flax. Okay, so if you want to see what this might look like, you can turn to page thirteen and squint at the last picture. Um, but I have big ones that I can pass around. Um, so these are from a 13th century, uh, sorry, from a Haggadah that was probably published in around 1300. I printed out the page from the British Library that tells you all about it, and this I will give to Renata, because she's the only one who's going to understand what these numbers mean. And, uh, and, uh, but here I have two pages from this Haggadah. One is a bigger version of what you have, and I want you to pay attention to this person. So they're car- these are it says Nachum at the top, we're in a bakery, they're baking matzahs, you can see the matzahs. And this person seems to have their hair exposed, and then they have a thing, and then they have a tray of matzahs. Uh, so I think that thing is what I would want to call a kalka, you can take a mess. Um, and this is another page from that, and here you have their, their, um, their kneading, it says Lasho at the top, I don't know what the first letter is, but someone's going to read it and figure it out. And these women also here look like they have their hair down, but there's like a little round thing at the top, and I wonder whether it's the same round thing as there, and that these are women doing housework wearing just kaltas. So, more medieval Jewish uh, and the evidence. Picture here also, she's wearing... So that middle picture, uh, we can get back to like all the other pictures at the end, but that was just like a fun kalta one. The middle picture, I think you have a woman wearing like a full hijab. In the middle picture? No, but the woman all the way to the left. So that's a child, as far as I can tell. And all the commentary on this picture that I could find said that was a child. Oh. 
And then you have a woman all the way to the left, and she's like inshal. And she has some hair showing, which is very interesting also. Okay. I'm not really cool enough to like be darshaning pictures, but so that, yeah. Anyways, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, ask other people who are smarter than I am about that. Um, okay, so anyways, but I think it, it might give you a sense of, um, of what a kalta is, that it's like a device used for carrying other things, and it helps you balance by having a way in which it grips to your head, like it's like dome shaped on the bottom, and then it's a basket that you carry stuff in at the top, so it has like a little like dome shape at the top. Um, okay, so that's kalta. Um, and then one last piece about Rashi that he gets to is like, what, how do we define these different spaces? So he says, derech mavui means lo rabim. It's a place where the, the like, public could be, but, there, but it, it's, not, um, where there, it's a place where there's not many people, where you, can't assu you assume that there would not be many people. Um, and so that means that these places are then potentially at least defined by um, how many people are, are in them. Uh, okay, so Rashi addressed, right, three, three of our questions were now just addressed by Rashi. So, what is a kalta? There's pictures going around. What is the status of a yard if there's a lot of men in it? It seems like Rashi would say if there's a lot of men in it, then you need to have something on your head. Um, what is that Yehudi? Rashi would say, um, Rashi would say um, it, these are practices, these are unwritten Jewish practices of Jewish women. Okay. Um, so the riff is going to add in something very important. Uh, so the riff just quotes. Uh, I've said this before. I've said this in the past, I think, but not everyone listens all the times that I talk. Um, so I'll say it again. The the riff is a very interesting genre. For the most part, the book of the riff is the Talmud, like with all the fat trim, like anything that he thinks isn't the halacha, he just cut out, and then he like produced it as a book. This is the riff. Um, Interestingly, every, every so often the riff will add something in, and this is one of those cases. So the riff quotes the Gemara, he says, So there's a case where the kalta is sufficient, and then Abaye explains what that case is. Um, so it's, it's when you're going from one courtyard to the other, or via an alleyway, and then the riff brings in the Yerushalmi, which is Again, like it, it, the riff does it sometimes, but it, it's always like a flashing light when the riff does that. He says, the Yerushal, what is the Yerushalmi? Chatzer sharabim bok imbo harei hu kemavui. Mavui she'in harabim bok imbo harei hu kechatzer. So if you have a courtyard that lots of people are going into, then it's like a mavoi where you need to be wearing a kalta. And if it's a mavoi that no one's going into, then it's like a chatzer, and maybe you can go without anything on your head. Okay, so he's going to say, yeah, it's actually contextual. Where you are, like, how many, how many, it's not just where you are. Where you are is actually just a signifier to how many other people are going to be there. But if you're somewhere that, like, I might call it a chater, it's your private property, but you're, I don't know, you're um, a not aviv, and you're, like, hosting people in your house all the time because you're the consul general, then, then your, your home is not, is not truly, like, a private for, for this halachic discussion. Okay, so that's what the Yerushalmi adds in. The fact that the Rif is like a very um, important scholar and a teacher of, of multitudes brings that in is gonna give that a lot of heft um, going forward. Give that Yerushalmi a lot of heft in a way that the Yerushalmi wouldn't necessarily otherwise. The Yerushalmi is not always like an authoritative text. The Yerushalmi gains its authority by being brought in by other people usually. Um, okay, moving right along. Um, so the Rosh is gonna is gonna now going back to that question about like what is what do we mean by Dai Yehudit? So the Rosh is now gonna explore that question. So he's gonna say, Haida Uveret al Da Moshe Yehudit in La Ktuba. So this woman who violates that Moshe and Yehudit, she forfeits her Ktuba. Um, and that is Bidavar Shahimach Shilto. Um, so some, so a way in which she is like tripping him up. And he says that those are the cases of the Mishnah. Like she feeds him forbidden fats or she feeds him blood. That was in today's daf, by the way. Chalev came up for anyone who's following along. And similarly, if she, um, if she makes a vow and she doesn't uphold it, um, there's a, there's a, a phrase in the Talmud that I, I didn't bring it in last week, but he, you can't understand this line without it here in the Rosh, which is, if you, uh, women who break their vows, her children die young. That's, uh, that's the phrase in the Talmud, so that's what they're talking about here. That if she breaks her vows, it affects her husband because their children will die. Um, that's the, 
that's the um, that's what he's talking about here. Um, so, uh, so right, so she is tripping him up through her misdeeds. But if she violates the mitzvah in other ways, for example, if she herself um, ate something prohibited, uh, she does not lose out. She doesn't miss her. She doesn't forfeit her ketuba. And now he's going to explain what he thinks that Yehudi is. That Yehudi mishum chatzifuta umishum chashad znut who demifsida. So that Moshe, you lose your ketuba because you trip up your husband and cause him to violate Torah level violations or his children die. That Yehudi is a totally different thing. That Yehudi, you you lose your ketuba because you're because of your chutzpahdik way and because we suspect that you're um, that you're engaging in in like prostitution kind of inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, and that's why you, you lose out on your ksuba. So pretty different from Rashi's definition of that Yehudi. Rashi's definition of that Yehudi was kind of these like folk culture, women uh, kind of act, um, ways of being. And, and, and if you violate that, like you violate the sisterhood norms, you lose your ketuba. The Rosh is saying something totally different. The Rosh is saying you, you violated like Jewish sexual ethics and that's why you lose your ketubah for Da'i Hudid. Okay, so two, two like quite different understandings of Da'i Yeah? How, where does he get that from the mission? Like, it's clearly like, the, what he's talking about, like feeding in food that's us or that's the Moshe. Mm -hmm. And so Da'i Hudid, though, you have all these examples of Da'i Hudid, and they all, they all seem to be about like sexual immorality. Right, so it's about going out with your hair uncovered, it's about spinning in public, which I, we're going to see later, like the Rabbam and a lot of other people understand that to be like, you have like a rose in your hair when you're doing that, and there's something like kind of like sexy about that activity. Um, yeah, but it, what it doesn't fit in with is like Abba Shaul, who says it's about her cursing her in-laws, that it doesn't fit in with the Rosh. Um, but her speaking to any man, that kind of does. Right, yeah, you, can, you can make it work, yeah. But this one is suspecting. Mm -hmm. of, of bad behavior, as opposed to... If you knew it, then she'd be a sota, or, or, well, but or worse, yeah. It's, it's like, it's, it, in my mind, I keep thinking religious police. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, somebody's watching you, and if you're suspected, that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> you don't like it. <laughs> no, 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 I, I realize I don't have to like it, I mean, I know, but it's, it's, it's different than, than if someone is doing something and... Um, oh, meaning if she did all these things but clandestinely enough that her husband never found out, then it would be okay? And, and the fact yeah, that she's that's suspected of something doesn't mean that she is actually done or engaged in something else. Mm -hmm. But if you violate it... Yeah, it's enough for it to be just a suspicion that she may have done something for him to divorce her. It doesn't matter if he did it. It's just, she now has, like, people like this, that she's no, no. doing the things that violate that UVD, and those are, are indications that she might be doing something. That's what that's, that's, yeah. She is engaged. Right, we know, it's not like, oh, that. did she go out with her hair uncovered or not, mystery. It's, we know she went out with her hair uncovered, and what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that she probably did that because she's flirting with someone. Right, that. Right, but, but the, I think the point is that even without the certainty that she did it, even if we're just suspicious that she did it, that's enough for him to divorce her without giving her her... Okay, but the it in your sentence is not hair uncovered. The it is yes. sex with another man. Yes, yes. Yes to what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, <laughs> Glad we're all on the same page. Okay. Um, um, cool, okay. So that's, so that's the Rosh. Um, and, and just an insight. I, I mostly brought it for his insight on that idea. Uh, okay, now we're going to look at the Rambam. The Rambam does something very interesting with his um, Da Yehudi and Da Moshe. And mostly you need the Rambam because he's a setup for the Shulchan Aruch, which we'll see in a little while. Okay, the Rambam. Um, Oh, so sorry. Everything we've seen until now is commentary. The Rambam is now a code, so he sounds a little bit different. Um, he's, he just quotes a lot less than everyone else does. These are the things that if you do any of them, you violate Da Moshe. Example number one: He, she goes out into 
the marketplace and her hair is uncovered. What just happened? Change the category. Okay, perfect, right? This was the Mishnah. The Mishnah brings this as an example of Da Yehudi. The Rambam says, Ma, it's an example of Da Moshe. What's the Rambam doing? And on what authority? Yeah. And there was a discussion that Zoraika, right, that, 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 that covering hair in Zoraika, so um, although he seems to be shifting the categories, he has some kind of scriptural basis for saying, well, no, it is written in the Torah, it's not just a cast of a woman. Beautiful. Perfect. The Rambam is doing the following. He says, yeah, it happens all the time. We have a Mishnah, and then the Gemara like, softly amends the Mishnah. Sometimes it's called a Chisuri Mechsara. Like, the Mishnah, oh, the Mishnah says this, but like, it meant to say this, so like, let's read it as... It, meant, it says A, but it meant to say B, so like, let's read it as B. He's saying, he's saying that's, that's the conversation that happens in the Gemara. Oh, the Mishnah put... Um, goes out into the marketplace with the hair uncovered as an example of that Yehudi. The Gemara raises an objection. That objection is 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 upheld, meaning that objection is is sustained. Um, and so the Rambam says, "Perfect. That is the Gemara, like softly tweaking the Mishnah, and I'm just gonna make it explicit for you." That and and, and honestly, it's like a perfectly good. Re- you don't have to read the Gemara like that, but it's a perfectly good. Read. What's interesting is that really where the Gemara lands is that it's probably a Doraita to go out with, or like the way we were reading the Gemara, let's say like that. The Rambam is a much greater scholar than I will ever be. Um, the way we were reading the Gemara was that goes out into the market um, without a Kalta on. That's a violation of Da Moshe. It goes out um, with just the Kalta. That's a violation of Da Yehudi. And the Mishnah was just talking about the latter one because. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not an Avera that fits in the category of that Moshe, because that Moshe are things where she trips him up. Her going into the marketplace with her hair uncovered isn't causing him to sin in any way. So the Rambam has also now shifted the category of that Moshe away from what the Rosh had just suggested of the Var Shehimach Shilto, something, so a way in which she's tripping him up, towards Dorei does, something like that, right? Any, any Torah commandment um, is, now, is now a Dat Moshe. Um, which is not, which is a totally fine read. Disagrees with the Rosh. Um, okay. Um, the rest of them are all the examples, more or less, in the Mishnah. And then he's going to say, well, how would such a thing be known? And there's like a whole like evidentiary uh, process, which is kind of fun, but we're going to, oh man, is that right? Um, oh, <laughs> this is terrible. Okay, we're going to plow right along. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, folks, we're going to go late. You should just leave whatever you need to. Um, okay, so then he's going to say, but, no, but never fear, like, hair covering is going to come back in, in that Yehudi. What is that Yehudi? Yotzal uh, shok. I'm just in the underlying parts here. Yotzal HaShok, Olam Avoi Mifulash, V'Rosha Perua, V'Ein Alea Redid, K'chol Anashim, Avo Bisha Sa'ara Mechusaba Mipachat. So he's going to say, if she goes out into the marketplace or into an alleyway that's open on both ends, mavui miflash, and her hair is covered. And what we mean by her hair is covered is that she was wearing a kerchief, but she wasn't wearing a veil. Okay? So the Rambam is imagining that women are kind of like double covered. You can, I think the easiest way to picture it is like, imagine like a nun, where they have like a little white thing and then like a veil on top of it. So like he's saying, you go out with just the, the bottom level, like, that's not, that's not good enough, and that's a violation of that Yehudi, and you need to actually go out with a full veil when you're going outside. Um, okay. Mm, we're going to skip the rest of the Rambam. Uh, the Trumat Hadeshen, you have information about him if you're unfamiliar. He is, he's, he's, uh, he's in Austria. He's, like, one of the most important Austrian rabbis ever. Um, and he's 1390 to 1460. He's, very, he's particularly important because the Roma really likes him. Um, and he is going to kind of, to- he's going to try, interpret, he's, this is, sorry, let me back up. He, this is a responsum written by the Trumat Hadeshin um, about a case where like a guy is married to a woman and she is like always going out into the marketplace with these non-Jewish men and being violating Yehud with them and this guy wants to ditch her and not have to pay her his ketubah and the Trumat Hadeshin is trying to figure out whether this man is allowed to do that or not. Um, fascinating responsum, we're not really going to go into it, but here's how he, he reads the Rambam as saying um, 
actually, we're just going to read the bottom three lines in the Hebrew on page five. Here the Rambam's talking about Yechud. He's, he's talking about Yechud and hair covering all at once. So he says, oh, the Rambam says that Yechud is just a, uh, just me divrei Kabbalah, so it's just like oral law or maybe a Darabanan. Ha'iyunami katav de priyat rosh be'isha, eno ela zehirut mi Darabanan, kedemuchach mil shono. He says, you can see from, he, he says, you see, and I'm not totally sure on what basis he says this, you see from the language of the Rambam that hair covering is also just a kind of a Darabanan uh, cautionary level of, of prohibition. Misama uh, Svirle, and, and it seems like the, this is the Shemad Adeshem writing about the Rambam, and it seems like the Rambam says, when the Talmud asked this question, oh, isn't it a Deoraita? What the Talmud means is that there's a hint towards a Deoraita, but that it's not truly a Deoraita. So this is the true adaptation with a radical reread of the Rambam, saying the Rambam doesn't think it's actually a Doraita. The Rambam thinks that the, that it's like a, you know there's a source for it in the Torah, but it's not it's not truly in the Torah. Um, okay, the tour. I think we're just gonna skip. He more or less goes. He quotes the. Um, actually, okay, let's just do his Ezohi Da Yehudi. It's the middle of page six. The tour says, "What is that Yehudi?" You see, Barosha Parua, she goes out, her hair is uncovered. A few in Peru, Lagamre, El Kalta Barosha, Kivan Sheena, Mechusa, Betsaif, Titsai. So he basically goes by the Ramam. He says, if she, even if she's just wearing a Kalta, that's a violation of that Yehudit. And she needs to actually be fully wearing a scarf in order to uh, be in compliance with that Yehudit. And then he quotes the Ramam as his proof. Um, okay. Let's go to the Shulchan Aruch, because the Shulchan Aruch drives things. So right now we've just gotten like stricter, stricter, stricter. Shulchan Aruch is going to blow things totally the other way. Um, so this is an extremely, extremely important source. Um, the Shulchan Aruch is going to say, um, the, um, Okay, so what is that? Yehudid, who min new chenahugu b'no Israel. Da Yehudit is the, the ways of, the tznias dika ways of Jewish women. So first of all, like, are we talking about Darabanans? Doesn't really sound like it. That's not really how you talk about a Darabanan. That's how you talk about a minhag, right? So we're already, Da Yehudit is a category that's like, has force, obviously. Everyone, you can't say that if you violate Da Yehudit, you don't lose your ketubah. Like, for sure, if you violate Da Yehudit, you lose your ketubah, but that is the force of Da Yehudit. Um, okay, so what is it? It's the practices of Jewish women in modesty. These are the things that if you do one of them, you violate a da'yehudit. She goes out into the shuk or into an open alleyway or into a courtyard that lots of people are going into it and her hair is totally, her hair is uncovered and she's not wearing a veil like all the women. Um, so he says, um, this whole, right, so he says, and even if her hair is not covered in mipacha, that's still, um, that's still da'ihudi. So, but what has he done with that Moshe now? Right, in the Rambam, this, wa- this woman was a violator of that, of that Moshe. And here, there's no mention of hair covering in that Moshe, it's all in da'ihudi. Um, okay, fine. I think we're just gonna, right, but he still thinks it's the wrong thing to do, which is what we saw in the, in the next section of the Rambam, we saw this already. Um, he still thinks like women should not have their hair uncovered, but there's no violation of that Moshe. It's all a violation of that Yehudi. Every level is, is a violation of that Yehudi. And more than that, men should never look at women. Where that comes up, what we saw before, comes up when we're talking about 
um, when we're talking about what men should be looking at. So, right, he has this whole business. Um, Man should separate himself from women a lot, a lot. You shouldn't look at any part of her body. And then he goes on to list lots of parts of her bodies um, and lots of places where you could look at women. You should not look at them. Don't look at them when they're doing laundry. Don't look at them when you meet them in the marketplace. Don't run after them. Don't anything. Um, and don't look at any part of them. Um, in order to promote this, women should not go about with their hair uncovered. And the only time you're allowed to look at a woman is to find out whether she's pretty enough for you to marry. Um, okay, good. So, so far, meaning no questions have been answered, right? We've opened up a lot of questions. Lots of people have different interpretations of them. We've seen at least three different interpretations of what Da'ihudit even is. Uh, we saw a different interpret the Rambam, we saw the Rambam's interpretation of what a kalta is, which would be just a, would be like a mipacha, it would be like an undercover, which you're supposed to wear something over. Rashi says it's like a basket that you should wear on your head, uh, that you wear on your head. Um, and, and then where even all these violations, like at what level any of these violations are, that's like, that, you saw the Rambam, which makes, every, makes it like a much stronger violation, and Shulchan Aruch, which, which like drops it down a step. Um, but ultimately, like, how are you supposed to be in the world? Unclear. I wanna, I'm just going to take questions in the end, so I'm already over time. Just a, a word about men, um, and nothing here is particularly new from what we saw last time, only that we're seeing it getting codified. So in Masachet Sofrim, which is like, we're talking like, maybe, it's often published with the Talmud, it's a later text than the Talmud, Masachet Sofrim, of all of the Masachet Oktano, is probably the most authoritative. You see it pop up particularly around Hanukkah and all sorts of other times. Um, and um, yeah, so it talks about hair covering for men, which is, um, if you just, I'll just read this last line. Um, if a man's head is uncovered, he's not allowed to mention the name of God. And so that's when you see people, oh, oh, you're gonna make a bracha? Okay, like put something on your head? Okay, take it back off when you're done making your bracha. So this is the source for that, and then it gets, um, it gets codified, um, which in the Shulchan Aruch, which you'll see that source C2 there. So Shulchan Aruch there says, Yishomrim shasru lo tzias karami piv berosh megla. You're not allowed to um, say the name of God with your head uncovered. Um, yeah, okay, well, let's go back for a second. I want to finish with that, the rest of that uh, Shulchan Aruch there. So the Rambam says, how are you supposed to prepare, like you wake up in the morning, you're getting dressed, how are you supposed to prepare your clothing for, pre uh, for prayer? So you have to make yourself look really nice, and you mehader, uh, right? You're supposed to like, like bring elegance to your clothing. Uh, uh, because when you bow down to Hashem, it should be with like the hidur of holiness. It should be with like, the glory of holiness. Uh, you should not stand in prayer in just your undershirt. You should not stand in prayer with your head uncovered. Uh, it's cute, he calls shoes um, foot houses. Um, it, and he says, uh, and not with your feet uncovered if you live in a place where you would never go to a king with your feet uncovered. Um, so he's really saying, like, you should embody this idea of tefillah standing before the king, and that means that you should look nicely for it, and one of those things is that your head should always be covered, um, which is kind of the opposite of, like, take off your hat as the queen goes by, um, but his, his vision is the opposite of that. Um, but that that's really what it's about. It's like the queen's going by, put your hat on for the queen. Um, and then that, that's kind of like stuck. Um, and then the Shulchan Aruch in, the, in, the, in uh, how you should behave in the morning, this is C1, says, um, it, we saw this in the Gemara and it's more or less an exact quote. You should not walk in, a, in an upright posture because that reflects a certain like haughtiness about you through your body. And you should not walk um, for Amot with your head uncovered um, because out of, out of respect for the, the Shekhinah, the presence of God, which is above your head. And so if you have a physical thing, I think the way to understand it is you have a physical thing on your head, you'll remember that your head is not the top of the universe and that the, the Shekhinah is sitting above you. Um, I just want to uh, 
get to this last Shulchan Aruch, and then um, we'll end and I'll take questions. Yish Omrim shows she asur lo tzi askrami pi berosh migla. You shouldn't say the name of God with your head uncovered. And by the way, like he's not here explicitly talking about um, men. Right, that, that, and and Masachet Tzuvrim here is talking about someone who's leading Tfilah, who's Puri Sal Shema, um, so that might make that more specifically talking about men, but the Shulchan Aruch here is not. Um, so again, back to this like ambiguity about who even is supposed to be covering their heads. Um, these types of prohibitions, like it's 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 unclear. And the Shulchan Aruch for sure. I mean, the Shulchan Aruch already said that 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 single woman should be covering their hair for modesty reasons, but here is also a more like theological reason of like of of based on on Masachet Tzuvrim of not um, speaking the name of God without, or an uh, askarat to the name of God, right? So when we say, like, Hashem, or whatever, that's all, like, a reference to, to the name of God. You shouldn't see that with your head uncovered. Okay, so here's the part that I like. And some say you should, anyone who tries to come into shul with their head uncovered, you should tell them, like, no, stop, don't come into shul with your head uncovered. But then he says, what constitutes covering heads? Kovaim hakluim mikash, straw hats, chashiva kisui, are considered head covering. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, this shul was founded by someone who was kicked out of a shul for wearing a straw hat. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he has the shul, we have the shulchan aruch on our side, to wear straw hats to shul when they count. Um, and then just the last point here, of al hanachat yad al harosh lo chashiva kisui, putting your hand on on your head is not considered kisui, doesn't count as covering. It's the same business, by the way, for tachin, um, when you go like this, or like this, rather, um, you're supposed to have something separate, like a sleeve, or like a, could use like, I don't know, any kind of garment um, to separate between your, your arm and your forehead because you can't lean on yourself. Like it's all one thing, so you're, it's not considered leaning if you're leaning on yourself. So here you're leaning on your sleeve. Um, and, um, and, and it's kind of the same thing here. Like you can't cover yourself with yourself. Um, that's kind of the idea. But you can cover... So if I put my hand on someone else, that person's head is now covered by my hand, but you can't cover your own... Um, it says the Shulchan Aruch, you can't cover your own head um, with your hand. Okay. Sorry I went over. Uh, hopefully it was worth it. Um, and uh, we'll be back in the next two weeks for some more like practical, modern-day uh, stuff. Thank you. Thank you.